So Sam, you're formerly head of BRI Video Publishing, now running Indicator. Um, you were absolutely key and integral in developing the BFI flip side um, strand, the Blu-ray and DVD strand at the BFI. Could you tell us a bit about what was your goal with that and ambition for BFI Flipside? I think and perhaps me. what shaped your thinking around it? Yeah, it was me and Jane jointly. Jane was my immediate... Can everyone hear everything? Sorry, yeah, it was me and Jane jointly, and uh, Jane was my immediate boss and co-conspirator in lots of things that we got up to over about eight, nine years when we worked here. And um, I think we just took your guy's great idea and put a, a British spin on it. You know, what you were doing in from 2006 onwards was finding kind of rare gems that didn't make it into the canon and maybe were getting lost under those kind of layers and layers of history. And um, we thought we could kind of take that to the label and focus on the British. The Brit you know, I guess Jane and I interpreted the remit that we were working with as being, you know, trying to put a quite heavy British focus on what the publishing label was doing. So we just set about, yeah, as I say, just taking your idea and giving it that unique kind of angle, really. And, you know, using it as a way not just to um, publish feature films, but to, instead of doing more kind of standard or classic extra features around it, uh, finding ways to get more and more uh, arch archive, you know, um, uh, things out, you know, so short films and strange documentaries and so on and so forth. So just kind and of I think there was, there was kind of different discussion about what titles would go on there and different people contributed to things. But what, in terms of what you wanted to release, what kind of guided your thinking? Just to sort of focus on that, perhaps, for a brief I don't moment. think there are any hard and fast rules. You know, I mean, there are lots and lots of great British films, but there are only, you know, a handful that get really remembered and, you know, that, yeah, like the canon is the word, isn't it? And for every third man, fallen idol, whatever, you know, there's a voiceover and uh, something else weird that no one's ever seen. And it was my opinion that they should be seen. They should be replatformed and reassessed. And it sounds quite grand, but the idea that then that might lead to a bit of a reassessment of what the history of British cinema is and um, a rethinking of what we think is great and why we think it's great. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, Jane. Jane, if, if, uh, if I might uh, ask you a question now if I may. Um, <laughs> Sam's just spoken about the sort of the established canon of British cinema, which is very much what you think of instinctively when people talk about the BFI. Um, how was it for you with your involvement in setting up this kind of uh, new initiative within the BFI, which presumably uh, rattled a few apple carts? Um, well, Victor, <laughs> uh, yeah, there was never a dull moment with Flipside. It was like just one small part of what we were doing in the video label, what Sam was doing in the video label, and my entire department was working on in distribution. But it was a good idea to take your, you guys, uh, yeah, your idea and, and ruin it. And to, um, uh, so what we were trying to do, as Sam said, was um, take the films from the archive and make them more widely available because the fact was... The flip side screenings at the South Bank were great, they were fantastic, but they were like one-offs. And there were people all over the country who uh, would like to have seen them. And also the beauty of video releasing, video publication, is obviously that you can contextualize through essays and additionality. And you can really extrapolate the, the, the value and the meaning of films that perhaps the value and the meaning is not um, immediately obvious. And I mean that quite seriously, that I think it's actually quite easy to be in love with the Pals and the Pressburgers um, and the real recognised classics of British cinema. It's very much harder to look at something which is sort of um, flawed in some way, whether it's because you've got an incredibly wooden actor. Um, I always put my finger on this as something like often films have like fantastic cinematography, but it, acting is just a bit off, isn't it? And, and I think, like, you know, w one of the things about, like, doing this strand as part of what we were working on together at the BFI um, collectively is that it uh, attracted quite a lot of collegiate hostility. Um, <laughs> and uh, sure it was quite difficult for many of our colleagues in the BFI to recognise the real value of what we were doing um, and also um, appreciate the amount of uh, tender, loving care that needed to go into the films both particularly technically to take the materials from the archive and make them look great 
but also um, the rights research was really tricky as well. So it's a fantastic project to work on, um, which involved obviously not just us, but lots of other people um, who are uh, here in the, <coughs> um, in the auditorium today and uh, not here, pres probably lying face down, you know, with a cold flannel <laughs> over them somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Can That's I just interject yeah. briefly for a moment? Because I mean, it's interesting hearing. I mean, I think maybe what William was trying to get at with asking Sam mm. is sort of what exactly do you put your finger on to choose a flip side film? And I know from watching it slightly from the sidelines, I know there was quite there was n not even agreement necessarily amongst mm. the team yeah, yeah, just true. deciding that's on the true. film. And we would watch a film phone, several yeah. times and say it's really good, it's really good. Well, I don't know, but I think ultimately, I think really? I thought it was this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said I was Joking. on the sidelines, <laughs> but I mean, I, I think Sam, what you brought to it was it was a sense of this is going to sell, this isn't. And I think ultimately, if you're running a DVD label, that has to be the bottom line. So we only chose the ones that wouldn't sell. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we don't like things to be too easy. <laughs> you know, because we had loads of other things that we were releasing in the, um, through the label, mm. like, you know, the French New Wave and Napoleon and, and the, the uh, BFI production board catalogue. That, that sold really strongly. So, yeah. yeah. I remember with Black Panther, that was a complete, almost a completely unknown for all. Very few people had heard of that. But I remember yeah. you like almost seeding stories almost with journalists, so that there would be sort of anticipation. Yeah. So you were kind of almost I mean, doing a lot of it was you were kind of doing marketing at the same time yeah. as like managing. That's how it seemed at the time. Anyway. I think there was quite a lot of uh, playing the long game with some of the things because mm. they wouldn't necessarily like you were saying. You know, you do screenings with colleagues, and they just can't. You'd like, like to come up, and they go. You know, and then just walk walk out and go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> and so you'd have to find ways to, you know, you'd be determined that it was going to be released, but it might take a year, you know, yeah. or ten years, or, or ten years, <laughs> yeah, of kind of stealthy activity and you know whatever. Um, Douglas, if I might uh, bring you in here really? <laughs> uh, to discuss the technical side of things um, now. Mr. Weir, you've worked on every Flipside release Pretty in much. one way or another. Um, can you tell us about some of the challenges involved in working with these kind of f films and uh, sometimes compromised materials? <laughs> well, <coughs> yeah, well, yeah, actually, that, yeah, that's a good point. I think just to sort of requote what Jane just said, we don't like to make things easy, and I think that um, technically you could talk for, I mean, I could talk for hours about anything, but you could talk for hours about every single release that we did on the flip side. Um, I guess, uh, I mean, like Sam just said, Nightbirds is a good example. I don't know if any of you have seen Nightbirds, but a good example of Nightbirds is the materials we got had sections missing from it when we were, going, we were presented with this, what was presumed to be the only 35 mil print in existence, and there were sections missing from it, and we're like, well, what are we going to do about this? And um, we came across the trailer, and it turned out that they cut their only print just to make the trailer. <laughs> so it's like cutting your fingers off, you know, to just so people can see the film. But every single, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, really, the, uh, the flip side when it comes technically, because sometimes the films would be in pieces and you'd have to reconstruct them from various sources. Uh, you'd get original negatives that were incomplete, so you'd use a print or you'd use a VHS. We've made trailers from VHSs, we've made films inserting bits from everywhere, bits of Super 8, you name it. I mean, the, the, uh, there isn't one technique that we haven't ut had to utilise to you know, put the films together. But then sometimes you'll come across a film and it'll be an original negative <laughs> and it'll be complete and it'll be in amazing condition because the fact that it's never been seen before is, means it's very rare, which means the film materials haven't really been touched. So quite often they're in very good condition. But then on the other side, the flip side of that, uh, sometimes materials are in terrible condition. There's no real middle ground, but then you can talk about the extras as well. So a lot of the extras, it's the same case. So there's a lot of technical work that has to go into just one flip side release. But I, I don't do it on my own. I've got you know people, <laughs> young people. But the uh, well, I've often thought yes. that when when things are not so so accessible or um, haven't been seen very much, that also even if you've got like a good negative or a certain element. You don't necessarily have a sense of how that was seen originally, or you haven't well, got much true. to compare I mean, to. Well, that's like, true. I mean, about questions about ratio I, I, or colour. Yeah, I mean, I like to say a lot when people ask about what we do. I say, well, you know, 
most of the job is research. You have yeah. to research the film. Even if you have the materials, that's great. Mm. You can make them look like whatever you want. Mm. But at the end of the day, a colorist like Jerry, who's up there, he wants to know what's the aspect ratio, what's it supposed to look like? And you have to give him that information. So you have to do the research. You have to find anything you can. That even if it's just a still from the set or anything, so you know what the colours look like, an idea, speak to people. Going back to Nightbirds, we eventually did actually find uh, the original reversal camera element to that. It was with a collector in the States. So things are about, again, that's down to research, just mm -hmm. looking and finding out and reading and the paper trail where everything is and yeah. then putting it all back together. So Joe, I wanted to ask you um, about another specific flip side release. So you've kind of worked on a few different ones and written for the uh, booklets occasionally and yeah, had different levels of involvement. Um, and there's one particular re release, of sort of slightly more recent one, which was a really big release in the series in many ways, which is The Excellent Symptoms by um, Jose Loraz, which people may know. And in many cases, the films have been sort of not so well known and they've had to be reintroduced, whereas this is a film that, you know, so, you know, it, it was the British selection for Cannes, it had a certain amount of visibility, but it was considered a lost film, so it was actually about, you know, actually locating it and, and so how, could you just say a bit about how did this missing film become a found film? Well, well that was, I mean, Symptoms was a film that had kind of been in my consciousness for a really long time because I kept getting emails about it all the time, oh, we're looking for this film, have you got it? I remember talking to you about it over coffee many times. You know, where is the film? Somebody said it's a Pinewood. I rang Pinewood. No, it's not there. So I'd sort of on and off been trying to find it. Then in 2010, um, to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the archive, we launched uh, a project called BFI Most Wanted. And I prepared a list of 75 titles. Um, and there had been a previous iteration of that particular project, which had mainly been 30s and 40s films. But I wanted to bring it much more up to date. And Symptoms was very obviously a title. I mean, we'd all seen the film. You know, there was a ropey tape copy circulating. Some five at yeah. some point or another, so we, we'd seen yeah. it, but where it was like, where the question is, where is the where are the prints? Where's the negative? So um, I had had to select a top ten from my list of seventy five, and symptoms was in there. And then it just, as these things happen, out of the blue one day, I got an email from a facilities house saying we've got four of the, the negatives of your lost films. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the end of the story because then you have to try and get the negatives out of the facilities, <laughs> which is not easy. But I managed to, with the help of the Belgian Cinematheque, get hold of the producer who was Belgian, although it was a British film. So it's quite a complicated process. And we managed to get the negative to the archive, at which point it was scanned and then Doug did a fabulous job of making it look amazing. And it, the transformation from that ropey tape to what we actually put out was, was incredible. And it was such a really satisfying project to work on and work on collaboratively with, with colleagues to, to make that happen from you know, beginning to end. That yeah. project was, was, was really, really great. Yeah, it's one of my favorite ones. Talking of favorites, <laughs> <laughs> Jane. Um, what were your favourites? Primitive London. I loved it. It was like, to me, I always thought it was the first one. It wasn't Bed Sitting Room was the first well, one. Well, there were three. There yeah. were well, there was, but I don't know, it's that pink <coughs> cover in the... Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I love Duffer as well, Duffer. I think it's a, an incredible pre eraser head Galt McDermott nightmare of a film, and we double-billed it with, um, what was it called? Moon Avenue. Moon Over the Alley, which has got like a, a cameo by Nigel Algar, who was like head of fiction. At and Mickey, Mickey Pierce from Only Fools and Horses as oh, well. So mm. it's a cameo like this amazing well. cast, and, and it was just <laughs> yeah. a really satisfying release for all the That's wrong amazing. reasons. Yeah. <laughs> Sam? Yeah, many, many. Uh, I mean, you're still bringing out your favourites now, right? Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. There's a long, long list, yeah. long, long list of near impossible things to achieve. Except we're fighting over achieve. them now. That's the yeah, difference. yeah, yeah, very exciting. I, I don't, we've I, not found the appointment yet, right? No, no, no. no. I, mean, I was Lindsay, great watching Lindsay The Lake again. The Lake, wow. yeah, 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 yeah. Amazing camera work in that film, right? And that Absolutely. weird sound design. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Dogs and favorites. cars featuring in both The Lake and The Appointment. Yeah. So many yeah, lengths. Do you know this other film, The Appointment, which is like Edward Woodward, post Wicker Man, kind of driving somewhere and he gets... Well, I won't spoil it for you, but let's suffice Not that you'll ever be able to see it. <laughs> no, yeah. well, you'll see it on the Video 2000 copy that's floating around on the internet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, you know, I loved. I, I'm a, I'm an underdog kind of guy. So I mean, for me, something like voiceover is 
it's just amazing that it ever came out as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I know I had a hand in it. Jane didn't want it to happen, but... <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> I don't know, but I just think it's... I think, I think that and Repeater is an incredible double, but just in the same way that... It was Duff, just a bit Welsh, wasn't it? It was a bit, a bit Welsh. I don't know what that means. Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> but in the same way that Moon Over the Alley and Duff is a great, great double bill of really extraordinary films, mm. I think voiceover and Repeater is as well. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking, Doug... Um, when we were watching Gigi Passion at the start there, that print came out of Stanley Long's shed, right? Yeah, when we were transferring <laughs> that, it's, it's not a very interesting story. I only, I only, <laughs> keep, you, I only keep you an hour or so. But the, well, no, the, uh, when, we, we tra when we were transferring it, he, um, yeah, he was an interesting guy to work with. But the, uh, yeah, you can ask me about that later. But the, uh, the uh, yeah, that was straight out of his shed. He said, oh, I've got a print here, do you want it? And I was like, yeah, all right. And we took it in and it was Gigi Passion and then we were transferring it. Again, I think that was Jerry. But the, uh, he said, oh, look out for the end. We were doing it in black and white. He says, there's a bit of colour. And I was like, oh, okay, mate. And we went to the end and yeah, there was the colour bit at the end. Yeah, that was uh, a bit of a shock, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I, it was a shock, but I can't remember why, but yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was also, can I just add, what was really exciting about dealing, working on that short film as well, was dealing with Gene Gotowski, who you probably know was Roman Polanski's oh, yeah. producer. And he's written the most extraordinary autobiography. If you want to read one of the all-time great film autobiographies, it's Gene Gotowski's, and it's called Of Bulls and Hutzpah. And it's about like surviving the concentration camps and regrowing his liver after liver cancer. And um, I had to clear the rights for the, our, our, our release of um, Gigi Passion with Gene Kotowski, who sent me this. He sent me these short emails, all in block capitals, you know, uppercase. I'm on a yacht in the Caribbean. Yes, you can have the rights. And it was it was all a bit like that. So, but I really think, think it was the same Less crew as Repulsion as well. Yeah. It worked yeah, on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. But that's another one of the great aspects of the whole project is the p mm. these people that you well all the all the links you know like yeah. go on that last one there you know not only is it a kind of a different take on that same man woman on the creepy holiday type thing but also you've got uh, people like Michael Armstrong who also worked with Pete Walker in there you've got Stanley Long again the circle always seems to come back to Stanley well, once you start looking for yeah. something and then Al Burrisford which is them together mm. right mm. so uh, it's just a weird set of connections you know and Stanley used to tell me how the crew all thought that house was haunted I, you know? I, uh, th this actually did happen after Stanley passed away I got an email from him no. yeah, what? this is true it's true but it, I, it was spam but I thought I was like oh my god <laughs> that must have been like Spamly the time Long, uh, right? no. <laughs> Long, yeah, yeah. yeah. Donovan Winter used to call me up after he, he yeah. died you yeah. were <laughs> what? that's because you didn't release any of his oh, films yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> check indicator schedule for the next year <laughs> No, no, was there something? Um, yeah, I know what it was. Go on. It's that, um, what's he called? Uh, uh, that creepy Peter Whitehead, Peter Fast. Oh, God. Daddy. Daddy. There was some talk about doing that, the Nicky Desan file thing. Right. Uh, what was that? T Take an easy ride was something we looked at. Yeah. That's a while. And I guess we just sort of decided it might be a, a step too far for BFI. Uh, <laughs> don't know. Don't know whether we should, <laughs> have, should or shouldn't have, <laughs> but... I guess you've got to be careful, you know, if you are the BFI, there's a certain amount of, you know, upstanding citizen thing. And I guess there's an Conversely, I mean, oh. is, is there something you did that you think, I wish we hadn't done it? <laughs> oh. uh, God, that's a good question. What do you think? Jane? No, I'm, I'm happy with, I'm happy with it. But well. that previous point, I think, is interesting because in a way, a lot of the flip side thing is like looking at these films as artifacts. So mm. we, like you were saying, like there might be some bad acting and it may be there's some kind of contentious elements to it where it's like, well, can, how much can we look at them as art artifacts and how much are we implicated in what they mean or how they resonate now? I think that's kind of always a tension with I've what, what it was about. I've got a slightly different answer to a slightly different question, if it's all right, just to, um, to do yeah, that. I think there random. are some things that didn't go in the flip side that we released that I, right. I, I have a kind of personal wish that they had, like the Jane Arden and Jack Bond movies would have been quite nice in there. Yeah. I, I would think. like to put the devils in the flip side. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I mean, um, kind of it, we thought it was too big, didn't we? And, too well and, and Warner Brothers would get upset if we yeah. put it in the flip yeah, yeah. side. But one of the important things sorry. about what the flip side does is, is the contextualization, which is, was key to your screenings, but then was also a, a, a 
crucial part of the releases because you've got to have those voices mediating the, the material to some degree. Yeah, absolutely, because I, I guess things that appear more troubling now, more than ever, need some kind of contextual voice that can sort of put it into a position where we look at it not just as a thing that's coming out now, but a thing that's part of history, mm. right? Mm. You know, I've been given the head shopping sign, oh, okay. so, yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> sorry everyone. Don't forget to buy this, folks. <laughs> Kosh Boys available oh, in the yeah. shop, and the party's over shortly to be deleted. Um, they're in the shop afterwards, it's a good and we'll film. be in the. Mm. It is yeah, a good film, yeah. and we'll be in, in yeah. the bar if you want to come and harangue us further. Um, <laughs> thank you to our esteemed <laughs> panel. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks so much. Joe Botting, Jane Joel, Sam Dunn, Douglas Ware. <laughs>